whether you agree with my arguments or not, whether you agree with the distillation of certain lessons or not, I am fairly confident that any leader out there can look at inside this book, reflect on the life of career of Caesar and say, there's something in his example that I can learn from. Welcome back to Mind Matters, everyone. I'm Harrison Cayley, joined with my, by my co-hosts, Elon Martin and Adam Daniels. And today we are pleased to have with us Philip Barlag. The for, let me ask really quickly, Philip, how did I pronounce your last name right? You did. It's uh, it's a surprisingly difficult, tricky six letters, but you nailed yes. it. Okay, good. <laughs> he uh, Philip is the author of uh, this book. Oh, let me get it on screen here. The Leadership Genius of Julius Caesar: Modern Lessons from the Man Who Built an Empire. This was published back in 2016. It's not your only book, Philip. You've got a new one coming out in a month, I believe, called yes. uh, "Evil Roman Empire," even "Evil Roman Emperors." Right. So uh, I can't remember the subtitle off the top of my head, but maybe we'll talk. Maybe we can get a, get into that one a bit later on. Sure. But to start out with, I wanted to ask because this is an interesting book. It's it's not your typical Caesar book. Most books written about Caesar or um, the the time the time period, the history of Rome, are written by either historians or classicists or something of that sort but you've right. got an interesting background so maybe could you just tell us a bit about yourself your background and then we can we can go from there actually because i want to hear a bit about you yeah sure thank you and and thank you all for the opportunity to speak to you um yeah it, it I, I always find myself qualifying that i come to such conversations with no manner of expertise and that that applies both in terms of writing as well as what i do professionally which is essentially facilitating knowledge exchange between corporate executives so that they can learn from and share with one another. The premise being that the best executives in the world have to be open-minded and, and admit they don't already have all the answers and the best people to provide ideas and answers are other people that sit in a similar chair. So we're, I, I work for an organization that facilitates knowledge and ideas. And so I'm tremendously privileged to sit in the room and listen to some of the top business conversations in the world and uh, it's extraordinary for me to be able to to be able to do so. I, I like to joke, although it's actually not really a joke. It is a truth. Uh, so you call it self-deprecation uh, with, a, with a strong element of truth that I'm the one person that doesn't belong in every room that I'm in. Uh, and so I get I get really tremendous opportunity to meet and listen to some remarkable business leaders. So and that's what I do professionally and personally, uh, you know, I always have had a strong penchant for history. Uh, I've enjoyed it personally. I didn't know how to access it terribly much until, um, you know, got married, started reading a little bit more for pleasure, found that I kept coming back to the same topics over and over. And uh, so I, you know, I am a profoundly amateur. Uh, I don't, I'm not a corporate executive, though I work with them. And I'm not a historian, though I write about it. Uh, so I, I just, you know, try to bring a sort of an amateur eye and lens to professional things and the writing is, is no different. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know that I'm necessarily qualified to have an opinion on these things other than more an aggregator of the opinions of people who do matter, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Yeah. So uh, that pretty much leads into the questions or two of the questions that I had. Number one was why uh, Caesar and why Rome uh, is being of particular interest to you. Uh, so that was the first one. And then uh, the second one, which is more interesting to me, it was what at what point did you realize that you could glean a lot from, from Caesar's life in terms of leadership? Uh, was it a... A particular moment after having read a couple of books about him, or did you already have an, a, an idea going into it? Uh, what was the kind of story about that? Because I, I think that would be interesting. Yeah, and, and they're, they're all great questions, and there's a lot to kind of unpack. So if I start to ramble, I have no hesitancy with yeah. you guys saying, come on, buddy, get back on track. <laughs> Right. Um, why Caesar? Why Rome? If I could answer them in, in inverse order first. So um, have, have you all been to Rome before? Never. Oh, no, okay. so I have. There's something incredible about that city. Uh, and I've once described it, that even the air has a little bit of a different taste to it, it which just sounds like a strange thing. But if you go and you really just sort of absorb the multi-sensory experience, it's like no, no other city in the world. But the first time I went um, was just after my wife and I were married. We were dead broke. Uh, we've been married. Our next anniversary would be our 20th. We're dead broke. And we got this super saver discount 
uh, on US Airways for round trip tickets for like 250 bucks. And we swallowed hard and put every penny we had and decided to go. Uh, and we'd been married for just a couple months. Uh, so in a second, it turned out to be our, like our honeymoon. And, uh, and incidentally, I remember the hostel that we stayed in had its own bathroom, which was a selling feature, but it was, they, they didn't say is that it was all the apparatuses of a bathroom and one thing about the size of a phone booth. So you could, if you really wanted to sit on the toilet, brush your teeth and take a shower at the same time. That's how poor we were when we went, everything got wet, no matter what. So anyway, um, we took a train, you land in Da Vinci airport, you take the train to Termini station. And along the way, you pass through uh, a gap that's been opened up in the city walls that, that ring the city, which are uh, known as the walls of Aurelian. And when you cut through a cross section of the wall, the genius of the Romans hits you so hard because you know this is ancient, you know this is antiquity, you're looking at something that was engineered nearly 2000 years ago and it's astonishing. And by the way, most of those walls are still intact. They've been enhanced over the, the millennia. But, and I remember asking someone who, who, who built those and what are they? And someone said, those are the walls of Aurelian. And I said, who, who the hell's Aurelian? Uh, and, um, I know, I mean, I've heard Marcus Aurelius, was that the same guy? And, you know, not knowing the answer to simple questions is an invitation to learn more. And so by going there, by experiencing the city, by, by um, uh, you know, by asking a couple basic questions, it, it sort of was the first pull of a thread of interest that I've yet to kind of find the end of. And that was going on nearly 20 years ago in Rome, by being there, by experiencing it, by seeing it, uh, gave me permission to start reading more by learning more, et cetera. And that to me has led me to an endlessly fascinating civilization, culture, et cetera. So Rome's history is described as well-documented with no absolute certainties. You know, I was thinking about this. There are very few things about Caesar that we know definitively, very mm -hmm. few. A lot we have from near contemporaneous sources, very little that's confirmed, absolute, everyone agrees, objective truth. Right. So, so much of his life, like so much of Roman's history, and this starts to answer the second part of that question, is the pursuit of your version of what you perceive to be the truth. And as I got to know Caesar, and by the way, this book was written five years ago, and I've continued to get him notes since, and my view on him has changed a little bit. So this is a point in time of an evolutionary process. I find him to be the most interesting, enigmatic, open to subjective interpretation person that you could possibly hope to have. Mm -hmm. And I actually don't even have one solid version of who he is. When I read history, and this will conclude the point on why Caesar, why Rome, before kind of getting into uh, 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 what you're going to have to remind me was the second half of the question. Fair enough. Um, my ultimate goal is to feel like if I were to sit down with that person and we were able to converse in, you know, in, in, in a language where we could understand each other with zero margin for error, would they feel comfortable to me? And I feel like I kind of have a sense that if we were going to go out and we were going to grab an espresso or a gelato, not to like overindulge in, you know, Roman's favorite indulgences, but that, that he and I would be able to have a conversation where his character would feel comfortable to me. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's sort of my burden of proof that I've done enough research to, to get to know who someone is historically. So mm -hmm. I love him. He's fascinating. He's deeply flawed. He's brilliant. He's always, no matter what you think about him, he's worth studying. And that's, that's kind of where, where I went. Um, so hopefully that helps kind of part one. Can you remind me the second part? Of the yeah. Question? Yeah. Well, that just to say that that really uh, nailed home exactly what I was kind of hoping to get at as far as like what led you on, on your, your journey into, you know, who he was and, uh, and everything. Uh, so thank you for that. That was awesome. Um, and then this, so the second part was, uh, was there a defining moment where it hit you that he was a great leader and there was much to learn about him or was it a, uh, just a process, uh, or right. You know, right. what was it? Absolutely. It, and it is, it's a terrific question. Um, so about eight years or so ago, uh, I did a, a nights and weekends, uh, MBA, uh, and in, incidentally, I'm currently in a nights and weekends master's of history program. So I've like been clocking along in the slowest pace of academic progress that you could hope to imagine. Uh, and I, uh, I remember the course load being somewhat intense and saving for myself a book that I had personal interest in, but I didn't feel like I could give it its attention until I was done. So was my graduation present to myself was to read a book called uh, Caesar, Life of a Colossus by a historian named Adrian Goldsworthy. It's a great 
great book. Uh, and I have, I have, uh, I've come to understand that there's different ways of telling history and he has a unique way of doing it. That's, that's, he strips out all the florid, what we don't know embellishments, but it still might be cool. Start of the story that, you know, some of the salacious details and stays grounded a little bit more in fact than others. And, uh, so then, uh, I just got fascinated with him in particular, and also the biography of him, the study of him, the leadership of him. Uh, and, uh, so I put that on one side and on the other, the first time I heard this anecdote with which I actually opened the book, which is sort of the one word that dismantled the unit, uh, the, 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 um, uh, why am I blank blank on the word, but the uprising of his troops, the mutiny, sorry. Mm -hmm. Uh, the one, he, you know, there's a big <clears throat> mutiny. He has one word. He says that one word, the mutiny shatters. I've come across that anecdote in, in not just in Goldsworthy, actually, I don't remember if he specifically talks about it, but in some of the things that are lauded as his great biographies, and it's such an incredible moment. And it hit the arc of his life is so big. The stories are so outsized. His influence on history, there's so much ground to cover that there are a lot of little moments where he demonstrates his genius that get run completely over in the arc of the broader historical narrative. Mm -hmm. And so what started my, let's study this guy as a leader was I need to know more about that one word, that one incident, that one example. And then I found out like, when you try to get past telling the whole story and you pick specific incidents, there's universes inside these moments that also warrant exploration. And in coming into those moments, that's where I felt like, hey, this is, this is someone that can be held up as having written a version of how to be a great leader that warrants studying. Hmm. Well, so Philip, I think one of the things that struck me so strongly about your book uh, in contrast to so much other material about Caesar that isn't just of a uh, dry historical nature, is that you do take some position on the man, and that is that he was basically a very constructive or had a lot of very constructive qualities about him mm -hmm. that were traits that could be looked to and emulated uh, in, a, in, a, in an individual who was seeking to do better. At, at leading people and organization. Mm -hmm. And um, I would just say that it's a, it's kind of a, an almost unique uh, or somewhat unique position to take on the guy considering, at least on a very superficial level, most people have this idea of Caesar as this dictator, uh, as someone who, um, you know, a very successful general, uh, who who had a lot of triumphs, but but certainly this dimension of being a leader for the people, of of genuinely trying to make conditions better for the average citizen of Rome at the time, uh, and and really honing in on that, and honing in on uh, all of the uh, qualities and and values he must have held in order to be so successful uh, as not just a, a general, but as a politician. So I, th I thought it was uh, a very unique um, or somewhat unique take on the man and, and uh, served to dispel some of the more kind of conventional, widely held beliefs or views of him. Um, and, and in that sense is, is quite valuable. Uh, to individuals who want to know a little bit in, in what is a pretty short volume. I mean, you've, you've distilled quite a lot uh, into there. Uh, but what I wanted to ask you, um, or maybe you can just comment on this a bit, uh, you discuss his uh, very high uh, ability to communicate mm -hmm. with his uh, soldiers, with other politicians, and with the public at large. And uh, this was, you write, a, um, a very, it's what made Caesar very successful in consolidating his, his power base mm -hmm. and in getting people to, um, getting people aligned with his, uh, the policies that he wanted to uh, implement. So I, I wonder if you might speak a bit about his communication skills. Yeah, thank you. And and 
you know, your 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 comment about taking a, a position on him and and kind of who he was and his genuine care kind of gets to why he communicated the way he did, and which was a hyper focus on knowing who his audience was. You know, Roman. Um, I'm not a Roman historian. I'm an amateur who loves Roman history. And it's an important distinction because someone who is a more professional listener or viewer to this conversation could rightly take exception to some of the things I think I've learned that may or may not be accurate. But, uh, you know, Roman uh, society, it's important to understand the structure of it, to understand the character of Caesar and, and why his communications were so important. And so Roman class structure was highly segmented based on rank and the highest order rank. Uh, and again, there was no empire yet. So there were no emperors yet. Some people claim Caesar as the first emperor. Some people claim his successor as the first emperor, but either way, he grew up in a world where power was intended to be distributed, but really was held in the small group of people. It was very much an oligarchic society. And the highest pecking order in the society was the patricians and the patricians rank were the people who could claim their ancestry to the, the semi-mythic founding of Rome under the probably entirely mythic Romulus. So if you were there at the beginning, then you have a right to be at the highest order of the social order. Now, Caesar's family, despite its impeccable in, in credentials, by the way, he also claimed descent from the goddess Venus. So he, he considered himself semi-divine, which would not have been weird in that time, though it might seem it now. They had fallen on hard times financially and Caesar grew up in what we would euphemistically call the slums, just outside the main city. And every day he would walk through the slums and he would be among the people. And he had a unique lens on high status, but low economic means in a way that created a bond between him and the common people or an affinity from him toward them that was probably not unprecedented, but definitely unique among the patrician order. And so he, he, he understood holistically who, what Rome was across the socioeconomic spectrum, across the social spectrum, more than his predecessors. And so what he could do uniquely in his communications was segment them to speak to the various audiences because he understood this is what the rank and file worker wants. This is what the rank and file worker thinks. This is what the patrician wants. This is what the patrician thinks. This is the aspirant. This is what they want. This is how I can connect with them. And he could orient his messages specific to their audiences in a way that was wholly unique. And yes, he was a voluminous corresponder. It said that he could stand in his command tent and dictate to four different secretaries at a time. He wrote, I mean, his, his commentaries on his campaigns are considered masterpieces of, of, of uh, Latin prose. He, it was required that a field general would send reports back to Rome. That, that, that he did that was not unique but that he oriented the message toward the people that would receive him and give him political support was. Most people wrote for the highest order of the social society. He wrote for everyone because he understood when he came back to Rome, those are the people whose support he would need to continue to draw upon. So not only was he a prolific communicator, he also used what he understood of the totality of society to target his message, to make sense for the audience for whom it was intended. In other words, everyone felt like he was talking to them. Mm -hmm. His soldiers felt like he was talking to them. The Senate felt like he was talking to them. The patricians felt like he was talking to them. The plebeians, the rank and file Romans felt like he was talking to them, or at least a big chunk of them would. Mm -hmm. And that's what made him such an effective leader is that he could easily flow between all these different segments of society and feel affinity for them and have it returned. Mm -hmm. Well, that's where that's what I think you, you are uniquely... Um, predisposed to bring to a conversation like this because so you you've categorized yourself as as you know not an expert in either world and you and you know you you, you exist in in places where you might not belong by the by the by the norms of that that institution right right but i think that i think that in this case it is actually an advantage because in your in your business world, in your in your profession, you deal with leaders, right? You've you've been in conversations. You've been able to see see what works, see see maybe what doesn't work, and then you're able to take that skill set and then apply it to to this 
you know, different field to, to roam, to, to look at accounts of an individual, of a person who happens mm-hmm. to be, you know, per, perhaps one of the, the most famous and most influential, pe- influential people in, in world history. But uh, aside from that, you, so then you, you have a, a unique approach and a unique way of looking at things that I think allows you to see things that others can't see or that might, like other people would, would read that story about the, the mutiny and just gloss over it as like an interesting point. Like you say, it, it crops up here and there, but, but that was the one that, that grabbed you and that, that was significant for you. And that's what I found about a lot of the, a lot of the anecdotes, the, the little stories that you include in this book is that they're not the, the biggest events in Caesar's life. They're oftentimes something very small and even insignificant from, from maybe a, a, a historical perspective. So when I, the way I see it, I think that that is an advantage for you that, that maybe mainstream or maybe not just mainstream, but that historians don't necessarily have because a historian oftentimes won't have that experience and is looking at history through a particular lens. I think, I can't remember if it was at the, if it was when we were recording or beforehand, um, when you were, um, you were talking about, oh, now I, I lost the train of thought, talking about history and uh, it's interesting now to contrast my amateur status with the early stages of trying to learn the professional side of being a historian which is mm-hmm. going through you know getting a, a degree in that and you know may or maybe or not roll through and go the you know the academic route from here on out and the the overall tone of what i've you know the, the professional trade of historian that i'm in the earliest possible phases of, of learning is the whole, yeah, but how do you know for sure? Mm-hmm. Is is the sort of, if I could sum up, you know, a year and a half of, of <laughs> history of grad school, yeah, but how do you know for sure? So there is this measure of skepticism. Yeah. And it's not to suggest that we shouldn't be deeply skeptical of anything that, that, you know, that we read or write or whatever. But I think there is an inherent, and I don't mean this in the political sense, I mean this in terms of the like, there's a peer reviewer, if, if, if the average person has a devil and an angel on their shoulder, you know, the, I think a historian, one of those characters is probably defined by the peer reviewer, someone who's, who's watching mm-hmm. uh, to say, yeah, but how do you know for sure, as they should, and provide mm-hmm. the right level of academic rigor inside history writing is parting part of being an actual historian for me mm-hmm. as a as an amateur i'm i am liberated from that as part of my subconscious as i write yeah and uh, that that does give me the opportunity to take the outsider's point of view and say yeah but how but what if this is the story that we can learn from and this is the example that we should should know in in a way that perhaps uh, you know, is a luxury that I, or a self-indulgence that I take advantage of because of my amateur status. It, mm-hmm. it, it is, it can be quite freeing to not be an expert, right? Yeah. And if someone disagrees with me or, or a viewer watches this or listens to this and says, yeah, but you're out of your mind because that didn't happen. I can say, I didn't know any better. I'm just an amateur. It's a great, <laughs> great cover, cover, you know, your what, uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> default yeah. thing to go well, to. Well, that's the, that, that thing about historians, that tendency and that, that kind of, that's that high level skepticism about events. Like, how do you know, how can you prove that that actually happens? Well, it works both ways, right? Because, um, there are, there, well, there are several, there are numerous perspectives on Caesar, Mm -hmm. but I, I would say that the main one is like, like you said at the very beginning of the book, I mean, you pretty much summed it up. Um, and I think, I think maybe it was Alan that, that said it, that you could pretty much sum it up as, oh, well, Caesar was a, uh, pretty much a, a brutal dictator, a warlord, and he was basically, he was basically so bad that the, 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 the good, decent citizens of, of Rome had to band together to, to assassinate him. And, um, and that's why that has carried on, um, that has carried on in culture and in, in American culture, even like with, uh, the Caesar is upheld as the, or Caesar, maybe not Caesar, but the, the Republicans, the, the, well, the patricians are held up as the, the people that saved Rome, right. Or that attempted to save Rome. And when you actually read it, it's, it's like, you can see where that comes from. You can see how that can be read into it. But from my perspective that you can apply that historical skepticism to it and, and look at it like this. Okay. Hold on a second. We're actually looking at history through the eyes of the patricians, Mm-hmm. And what they were saying about themselves, 
And a lot of the a lot of the history that was written about Caesar isn't necessarily contemporary. You have some contemporaries, like you have Sallust and you have Cicero and you have Caesar himself. Um, right. So you've got Caesar's um, what you could call like self propaganda because it was it was propaganda even if well, that was the purpose of it, right? And right. then you've got Cicero. But when you look at Cicero, Cicero is no better, and in fact is probably worse. He's uh, and when you look at Cicero's life and the things he reveals about himself in his letters, he's like not a very likable guy. Like he's one of those guys that you could probably have 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 uh, coffee with and leave probably happy that you're leaving the conversation with him. And then you have um, all of the then all of the histories about Caesar's life are actually written decades, centuries later, and from the perspective of largely of that um, of that patrician uh, mindset. So when you when you look at at what happens, if if you keep that in mind and look what look at the history of Caesar, then I think that's why I think that your that your approach is actually pretty good, and it's pretty much in line with um, like uh, the famous Rome history of Rome. Uh, what was his first name? Thomas or Theodore Mommsen, the, yes, the famous yes, German, yes. right? Like he he I think he. Well, I'll just say I, I agree with Mommsen. I think he he you know he saw things a bit. Well, I, that's just my bias. I think that that's that's probably a more accurate. I think Mommsen and your book is actually a more accurate view of what the character of Caesar was probably like. And of course, that's going to be a, just a judgment that every person's going to have to make um, because you can't know with one hundred percent certainty, right? But when you look, when you read through all of these all of these events, all of the little ones, little things come up, and right. it's, the one that comes up for me is probably caesar's clemency yeah and like because i think you've got some interesting things to say about it in the in the book but maybe maybe you could just talk about some of the things that some of the some more of the things that made caesar different for his time that really should make you like scratch your head when you when you find out about them yeah and thank you and it, it's funny you know you you frame him out as as in the popular conception of him as this dictator and as a general and he was a dictator for life but people don't understand, or what I, let me say it this way, what I didn't understand until I began really getting deep into Roman history, not even that deep, is that the term dictator was actually a formal office that was conveyed mm -hmm. upon people. And there were all sorts of examples of people having been and served as dictator. Uh, in Roman mythology, the most important is Cincinnatus, uh, which is, he was the appointed dictator. He solved the eminent crisis that threatened the Republic. He gave power back to the Senate. So it was re returning the military power to the civilian institutions, which is why so many people called George Washington the American Cincinnatus and why the, uh, the, the fraternal order of the descendants of the officers that served under him are called the Society of the Cincinnatus. He's lauded as this hero. You know, Caesar is great. Uh, misfortune in being, you know, murdered while holding that office is that that was the last title he had before he was, he was killed. And, you know, you, he was appointed dictator for life. He was appointed dictator for life because the Senate was incredibly sycophantic. And then they represent, they resented him for having had access to the power and unfettered and saw him as a great threat to the Republic. And it's, of course, it's always important to qualify. Republicanism means something very different 2,000 years ago in Rome than it means now. So we're mm -hmm. referring to it in the ancient uh, context of the governing structure of, of Rome. And he, um, you know, he, he was an autocrat. And he was a dictator in some of the less desirable ways in which you think about it. But he also did care about the population, the average Roman and he he uh, he really sought to convey improvement in the quality of his life, and I'm sorry, in the quality of the average life. And not just, by the way, not just Rome, but the the affiliated Latin communities on the periphery of Rome, the affiliated Italic communities on the periphery of, of late uh, Latium. So he he was a uh, an expansive thinker at a time when when it wasn't. And, and the reason to bring this up as a tortured way of coming back to answering the question is that it is always so important to debate with yourself whether you feel like you should judge someone based on the standards of where they were and who they were in their own time mm -hmm. versus what we know now, mm -hmm. right? And Caesar did things that were absolutely atrocious and it's not to forgive them. You have to be, anyone has to be the judge of whether or not you, you, you view him through a lens of modern values or ancient values. Was he 
uh, you know, radically awful for a modern time? Was he radically forgiving in the present time? I mean, you're, each person has to choose that for themselves. And I think that's where you see a lot of debates in contemporary society is, but when you look back on historical figures is, do we judge them by what we value now or how values were dictated, you know, or organized then? Um, so the, the clemency is a really interesting example. It, it's complicated, it's multifaceted. He offered pardon. If someone betrayed him or fought against him, his default was forgiveness. You know, uh, you're Caesar, I'm an opponent. I joined the wrong side in the, or, or what proves to be the losing side in the civil war. You give me forgiveness. It's magnanimous, but it's also self-serving. It, it's by, by forgiving someone, Caesar was also claiming the authority to forgive someone in the first place. And, and that's, you know, one of the titles of, of one of the chapters is co-opt the power of others. It, it was gracious because by the standards of the day, he had every right, or I shouldn't say right, but the social expectation was that he would kill his enemies. Uh, you would suffer. Uh, you would be banished. Your properties would be, you know, stolen, whatever. Your, your descendants cannot hold office. Your name is to be, you know, eradicated from the memory. So by forgiving people, he went way against what was the normative behavior for his time. Uh, but it also served selfish motives. And for his ability to lead Rome, if you think about it as a corporation, the more people that are indebted to him, the, you know, the, the, the more it smooths his ability to move forward with his agenda and his co-option of the power of others through the mechanism of forgiveness implicitly claimed the moral authority to be granting the forgiveness in the first place. Mm -hmm. And so it's important with Caesar and all the different ways that you talk about him to remember he was a guy that lived in a society that had different values, that had different behavioral patterns. And part of what made him so revolutionary was that he defied those values in that time. And you have to decide for yourself, whoever you are, you know, whether to judge him by the normative behavior of today as part of your assessment of his character. Mm -hmm. I think there's a, a personally, it's a little bit unfair to say 2000 years ago, you should have known what we value now. But again, that's up to each person to, to figure mm -hmm. out kind of for themselves. Um, you know, my favorite little anecdote, uh, you know, to your whole, like, what are a couple of the other things that, that really stood out as those little moments? Uh, it's, it's actually... Um, it's, it's, if I'm remembering correctly, it's referenced in Suetonius's biography of Caesar in the sort of the, the epic, the lives of the 12 Caesars, uh, is when earlier in his political career, uh, and please understand the Romans drew no distinction between general and politician. You were a leader or you weren't, and Caesar was, and one of the things that leaders were expected to do was go out and command armies. There was no professional military leadership class in quite the same way that we would think of it in contemporary society. So early in his career, he's in the rank of, I believe, is praetor, which is sort of like subconsul, which is at the time was sort of the highest um, elected office. And he'd been suspended from office for, for one reason or another. And the people rose up because they were so mad that their champion had been denied power and they were rioting and mob and they came to his home and they're banging on his door and saying, just tell us who and the mob will rise up for you and will drive off your enemies and we will put you in power. And this, and, and Caesar faced the choice. Do I take advantage of this and achieve short-term success, but prove all of my enemies right, that I'm this autocrat, thirsty for power, et cetera, or do I forego this opportunity and defy expectation? And a lot of Caesar's career decisions come down to the short-term investment short-term gain versus long-term investment. And he generally tended to opt towards the, the, the more cautious approach. Believe it or not, he was a pretty cautious guy as he made moves like this. And in this particular case, he said, thank you for your support, go home. And the effect was that he, his opponents were shamed because he proved them wrong. And he came back to power in, in office with more power than he'd had previously. So, you know, he was a really, really interesting at figuring out the right way to defy the normative behavior at the right time to always tend to bet on his long-term success at the expense of his short-term gain. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really useful lesson for any society, regardless of what the normative behavior is at that time. Mm -hmm. One thing that just came to mind when you were saying that, giving that anecdote, was another one. And you talk about this one in one of the first chapters in the book, and that is, um, it's, it's in one of the wars, I think, I think he's off in Gaul somewhere, 
and the the soldiers don't want to attack for some reason i think i can't remember the details maybe they're outnumbered or um but basically yeah. there he's he's got this army that doesn't want to do anything and what does he do he charges out alone mm-hmm. and and like so there's the, the their general here's this um you know protr- i guess in in any in, in any other con- context might be um, like to to borrow some phrases, like some, you 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 can imagine a situation where okay, here's this mamby pamby, um, upper class guy, you know, pretending to be a general. He isn't isn't really in it. He's just in it for himself. And we're we're the soldiers. We're the, we're the guys that are getting you know uh, are getting killed on the fields for 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 these guys, right? But mm-hmm. that wasn't entirely true even in Rome at the time because. Even back then, like you said, you had to be a general. You had to you had to establish yourself and prove yourself somehow. You had to have some skin in the game. But even compared to other Roman generals, there was something about Caesar's military leadership that was special too. Like not only did he pretty much always win, um, often through what seems like p- perhaps sheer luck, but also skill. This this I think this one stood out to you as well where Caesar runs out on his own and in, in, uh, into battle and that leaves his soldiers with a choice. And they're like, well, well maybe describe the story and how you, how you see it, how you kind of interpret it. Yeah. And, and you know, not to get too bogged down into who they were fighting and why, mm-hmm. but you know, C- Caesar has been marching his troops all over what we would today call Europe, you know, fighting this battle and that, and they're tired and they're grumpy and it's hot and, you know, give the litany of complaints and he knows I need one more big charge and the soldiers don't want to take it. And so, uh, yes, instead of commanding someone, if we you know the term decimate a population, the term decimation draws from the Roman military ranks where people would draw lots on the command of their officer. And the one who drew the short straw in a group of 10 would have to be beaten to death by the nine other people uh, as a punishment. Uh, and so, you know, that, is something that Roman commanders had done. If you were, if you refuse to obey, I'm going to decimate and they would do it. So, you know, instead of kind of choosing the whole, I'm going to slam my fist on the table, autocrat demand, your life is in my hands route, which again, what there was a pattern of that as normative behavior in the Roman military, uh, he chose instead to use guilt and shame to compel people by putting his own life on the line. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so, so they're standing at the bottom of a hill you know, classic military, the, the people at the top of the hill have a pretty strong advantage over the people at the bottom. It's hot. They've been in the sun all day. And uh, Caesar, not only does he charge the hill alone, but he rips off his helmet before doing so, or at least is portrayed in a couple of the sources that reference that give origin to the story. Again, there's always going to be some historian that said, that's bull, that never happened, but just <laughs> go with it because the example itself is useful. I do believe that this is perfectly in line with his character, by the way. And uh, so he ripped off his helmet and made a grand show of making sure everyone knew who he was. And by the way, the Roman military, the generals were entitled to wear certain colors and regalia that the rank and file troops wouldn't, and that his opponents would know who he was. So not only did he identify himself to his own troops, but also to his enemies, and he charged the hill alone. And, you know, Caesar truly was the champion of the common soldier, highly unique in Roman history. There are other people who are great populist. His great uncle Marius is one of them, but he, you know, he, for his time, the average Roman soldier did not feel that a general felt their pain quite the same way that he would have. And so not only are they shamed into action, but they also know if they lose him, they've lost their champion. And the next guy that comes in might decimate them. And so what's always so interesting about Caesar is that there was a, always a lot of layers to his, the motivation that he put forward Right, I mentioned that the the forgiveness is both magnanimous and self serving. Mm-hmm. This is also lead by courageous leadership by example, but also guilt and shame. And you you kind of they find <laughs> these unique contradictory elements so often find combination in him, and him charging up this, the the hill, shaming his troops into action. Who, by the way, spurned, you know, their you know let go of their own anxiety, charged up the hill, overtook him forced into the back lines of safety, slaughtered the enemy, won the day. You know, you find these unique contradictions that should be oppositional forces in combination within Caesar, within his leadership capabilities. And it's part of what made him so extraordinary is because he could just find different ways 
to connect with different people through the same actions in a way that I think is just truly historically unique. Well, one of the ways that you um, put this into a framework, Philip, is to, is to make the distinction between power and force. Right. And, uh, you know, it, it's very interesting to think of leadership as, you know, a, a one leader might coerce and threaten and, and basically be a jerk to his under league, uh, his underlings, and another one uh, wants to instill and uh, inspire uh, an authentic choice among the people that are um, supporting him. And it, it's very interesting. Uh, he, you, you discussed forgiveness, and um, as as having this dual purpose, and and it's empowering in one sense because. He is putting himself above as, as in having the power to forgive. But there was also a kind of a generosity of spirit that seems to be evident um, in Caesar. And I'm thinking in particular about the numbers of times that Cicero would like stab him in, in the back and, and commit all of these political maneuvers that were so uh, damaging to Caesar's agenda and to Caesar personally. And, and Caesar would continue to make overtures at friendship, at, um, at, a, at political alignment. So uh, something I wanted to say about that is, I think that that's what you perceive. Um, obviously you perceive it, you, you wrote about it uh, in strong terms, but there is that dimension to who Caesar was um, that you underscore for the reader. Uh, as as one of the things that had that had made him great, a great individual. Um, so, I was hoping you'd talk a little bit more about um, uh, along the lines of clemency and and forgiveness. Uh, what his personality? Because he, you know, you you describe him as a polymath. He was talking to everybody all of the time. He was he was creating all of these kinds of um, uh, connections with individuals that, yeah. that had made him, that had inspired uh, the public to, um, to, to give Caesar their vote, essentially. Right. The, the, um, the person who's probably the most surprised over Caesar's assassination was likely Caesar, because highly among the assassins were many people that he had at least at one point offered clemency to, including the most famous, which is Brutus. Um, uh, and he, he, he both was uh, almost naive in his faith in people to follow his agenda and cynical in his ability to create conditions in which they had no other choice. And he, uh, uh, you know, his, his idea of clemency. So let's give an example of what clemency, what would require clemency from Caesar. Um, and by the way, he, you talk about Cicero, he was remarkably tolerant of critical speech from other people. Remarkably, again, for the normative behavior of his time, remarkably tolerant of criticism and willing to engage in debate and discussion with anyone. There's a great anecdote that uh, when he's in the Civil War, uh, he is repeatedly asking Pompey, can we just sit down and talk? Can we just sit down and talk? Can we just, can we resolve this peacefully? Let's come to the table, let's talk. And Pompey is alleged to have refused because he understood that he could not stand up to Caesar's charm and that he, he, he didn't sit down with Caesar because he knew he'd be won over. So not only was he, uh, you know, was he somewhat skewed towards graciousness in terms of his treatment with other people or forgiving them their, uh, motives that might be against his alignment. He was also pathologically charming. I mean, he just, he could win over anyone. So sometimes in the case of Pompey, which again, may or may not have happened, he, uh, you know, Pompey refused to put himself in a position so that he couldn't be charmed because he wanted to stick to his obstinacy. Um, and so with his, uh, his, his policy of clemency, again, I said, let's give an example. So Caesar and Pompey are representing the two factions. Caesar has crossed the Rubicon in the literal sense, which by the way, in a fun, like nobody knows for sure, no one knows where the Rubicon River actually is or was. 
So anyone who claims that they've definedly said this is the spot where Caesar Cross is full of it. So, you know, to prove that some things are ultimately unknowable. Caesar's crossed the Rubicon, he's invaded Italy, he and, you know, Pomp, you know, whatever. There, there, there now you have these two oppositional forces, Pompey representing the sort of the establishment, which is ironic itself because Pompey, Pompey arose as a populist and a great partner of, of Caesar's. And Caesar is sort of the populist, every man. And that's a way too simple reduction. In the reality, it's mostly about their, their egos, but they each have their factions that back them. And so someone who was a senator among the patrician class or, or not is going to have to choose which side of this fight they're going to be on. And most of the senatorial class threw their lot in with Pompey, including Cicero. Uh, although Cicero equivocated more than any person who that you can imagine. I mean, he was just back and forth and back and forth. And, and Cicero is himself a really fascinating guy, as, you, as we've all alluded to. So let's take, um, you know, some senator chooses Pompey and they throw in their lot, they take up arms, they raise money, they raise troops, they sail ships around, they, they get involved in the various uh, tensions of the civil war and uh, they lose and they're captured and they come before Caesar and he puts his hand on their shoulder. And again, I mean, I'm being you know, visual. I have no idea if that's actually what happened. And it says all is forgiven. So this person might come before Caesar and expect to have, you know, the order given that their head be severed from their neck, which, by the way, was the execution of a Roman citizen was beheading. Uh, so, you know, if you get into like start to get into biblical history, who was beheaded versus who was crucified is also often who was a Roman citizen versus who was not. But anyway, that's just a useless little piece of information. And instead of being executed for their crime of having fought against Caesar, they would be forgiven. And generally his policy was, I'll forgive you once. And if you take up arms against me a second time, that's when I will default to the normative behavior. So it's not to say that he would never have done that. And, and think about the consequences of uh, the second time you've been caught once, you know, again, for lack of a better term, caught. Are you going to risk it a sec again? You know, probably not. Uh, and so you know, Caesar's ability to uh, take away people's, you know, block off other people's access to power was in large, he could position as being magnanimous. So that's where we talk about the conflicts of different contradictory motives existing within the same action. But it's a complex thing. But to be able to say, I forgive you is, is very powerful. And most of the people to, that were forgiven um, spent the rest of their lives and careers being at least not in opposition to, but generally supportive of, of Caesar. And if you'll allow me to answer a question that hasn't been asked yet, but is, is related, something that I feel very strongly about uh, is that Caesar, the, he's most famous for having been murdered and being assassinated, right? Beware the odds of March. And for a political leader to be assassinated in the ancient world is generally comes with this stink. They must have been a failure, right? He was an autocrat. He was a dictator. and People rose up and they killed him because he deserved it. And he was not successful. And if he had been successful, then no one would have wanted to kill him. Caesar came from a long line of populist reformers, all of whom were murdered, right? And, and you can go in some of them, they all use various means to try to achieve their goals. Saturninus, Marcus Livius Drusus, the Gracchi brothers, like they, they all met very violent deaths, as did Caesar. The difference is that Caesar got his agenda to stick for two decades before he got killed, as opposed to being killed in the moment of reform. And so, and a lot of what he ended up doing survived him by hundreds, if not thousands of years. And, and along the way, he also gave us a template that we can learn from. So you know, lest anyone think that he was a failure because he was assassinated, you know, my earnest plea as again, as an amateur is to disavow people of that notion. It's to remember what he achieved was staggering, even at the expense of putting himself in a position of, of being killed by people he considered friends and family. Mm -hmm. So there you go. Rant over. <laughs> no, thank I'm back you. on track. Just uh, hold on one sec. Your mic's sure. not working a lot. Well, I'll just jump in. Um, for a second here testing um the so that that really gives you uh a sense like all of these different little little things um 
about uh, Caesar and his clemency and his ability to create new avenues or, or ways of, of behaving that, you know, up until that point didn't exist. That's a very creative thinker uh, on, you know, for, for one aspect of it. But then it's also his ability to, um, uh, to, to balance out, not just like you were saying before, the short term, uh, goals versus a long term investment uh, or short term short term gain versus a long term investment and that seems to be somebody who has struggled within themselves to uh really define for themselves what they actually want do they want the short term short term game are they that short sighted or do is there something about them that is deeper than that 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 has this uh this bigger aim or this bigger image or 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 world that they're they're wanting to create um that <sighs> Uh, that really comes through in, in you know what you've talked about here and in, in, in your book as well is just uh, the the extent to which not only that Caesar understood people, everyone, you know, high and low, far and wide, but also mastery over himself. Uh, and I was um, was wondering if you might want to. Uh, speak about uh, that as well in terms of you know his his self mastery and also his uh, his his understanding. Yeah. In contemporary politics, one of the quickest ways to marginalize someone is to label them a narcissist, right? Mm -hmm. And it, don't get me wrong, regardless of where you fall on the political spectrum, at least you know here in the U.S., there's plenty of narcissists in <laughs> politics. So sometimes yeah. that, oh, yeah. that 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 label is appropriately applied. And, and you can ask the question, like, was Caesar a narcissist? Was he really truly about himself? And was all of this just a play for him to have access to power? That is one of the questions that I would consider to be unanswerable. But what I would say is that, you know, Caesar understood that there was enormous power, massive power to be gained in defining the expectations that people have of you. And that if you want to progress, then you need to stand out. And if you need to stand out, you need to be different than what people think you're going to be when you have the opportunity to demonstrate it. When Caesar uh, had come back from, you know, various campaigns, and, and I'm, I'm, I, I'm taking great pains not to get bogged down in the like in the 40s, yeah, yeah. you know, type stuff. Um, uh, but you know, he comes back from one of his campaigns, bless you. Thank you. And he is, uh, he is the, tr the ultimate moment in a Roman's career to was to demonstrate military glory. And the best way to demonstrate military glory was to, to be granted a victory parade, which was known as a triumph. And it was prohibited to bring tr armed troops into the city of Rome inside what's called the Pomerium, the sacred boundary of the city. And for a general who has been voted a triumph that they get to bring their army through and march through the streets and throw big parties in there and, and everyone you know, that, that is the moment. And, uh, you know, Caesar's enemies saw him as this dangerous threat. Either here's a populist trying to use the masses to gain political power that could shake up the order. And, uh, you know, there's a deep fear of populism then as there is now between the, the, um, what would then be defined as the, uh, the conservative uh, element of Roman society, i.e. the defenders of pat patrician privilege. And Caesar uh, had been awarded a triumph, but in order, but also wanted to stand for election to consul it was before his first consulship. And the consul, you know, the, the Romans had this thing called the cursus honorum or the end of the course of honors where you went through increasingly more competitive elections. You know, there might be 16 offices of the lowest rung and then there's two at the top and that two at the top is, is consul. <laughs> And so in order to qualify for office, you have to be inside the city limits within the date of qualification. And he's got his army ready. They've been voted a triumph and they're outside the pomerium, but he also needs to be inside the city without his army to qualify. So essentially the Roman Senate and his enemies put him in a position of having to choose between the glory of the triumph and standing for office, which by the way, the office expired a year. And if he, if he deferred, his elect, you know, his candidacy, he would have won it a year later. So do you want the office now or do you want the triumph now? It's really what it came to. And everyone expected. The, the triumphs are so rare. There was a period, and I'm, I'm, you know, who knows how accurate it is, but where every triumph and triumph in general was inscribed upon 
the stone that ever, you know, marble that people could see, like those are the, you know, 20, 30, whatever the number is of people who have achieved this highest honor of society. And uh, it was a higher order honor than the consulship itself, right? That is, you know, unmistakable. Not every consul was a consul, but not every consul was triumph, right? And he went completely against the expectations and entered the city without his army, told his troops, go back to your camp, came in, stood for office, was elected. And then that's what really put forward the rest of his, his political career was that understanding the massive power and defying expectations. So don't be who everyone thinks you already are. Be a little bit different because it gets noticed more, not only, do, and, and then you gain more momentum, you build your brand around yourself. And, mm-hmm. and that was, uh, so he was so unique at finding the right moment. I mentioned the time when the, you, know, you could embrace the mob and, and do what all the other populist reformers in front of you have done, or you could tell them to go home and he told him to go home and everyone was shocked. And here's a great, another great example. The like, do you triumph or do you achieve the high political office? I'll go for office. I'll bet on myself. I'll get the triumph later. And he did. Um, and uh, yeah, so there you go. Mm-hmm. I think that's probably, that's one of the reasons why many among his peers didn't like him is because he was so successful. Because like, it's almost hard to put into words and you've done a pretty good job of what exactly was going on here? Because it was there were so many contradictory elements and and ways of looking like looking at this. Because he, Caesar would do something, and at, at that moment it would be the best for his career. It would be unprecedented; no one would expect it. It would probably be good for not just him, but for other individuals, other other groups, maybe maybe his troops or or whomever um, pe- uh, people in the in the in the empire who might. Well, allies who might become citizens or whatever, but he he had this way of finding the sweet spot, right? Finding the the one thing to do to not only make life better for him, but for but and, and and in the long term. And it's it's almost like he had this super calculating mind that could just see all these possibilities and just be like, okay, that's the one. You know, in this battle, how am I going to win this battle? Uh, you know, running through the all the possibilities, all the alternate universes. Okay, that's the one. And it just, you know, and it worked for a long time. Yeah, it's astonishing, you know, like the the, the movie A Beautiful Mind, when when John Nash can see all the numbers yeah. floating, <laughs> right? It, he, you're you're absolutely right. He he just had this ability to, to do that, and 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 he always knew how to play the right emotional tone with the right person at the right time. And you know, he could be stern when he needed to. Right. Mm-hmm. He could be withholding of his affection when he needed to. He could be overly gracious. He could be downright seductive. I mean, obviously, his, his uh, mistresses the, are, are legion. I mean, there were so many of them because, you know, that was just part of how he accumulated power. Uh, and he, he is an interesting guy. I mean, you, you, we've mentioned Cicero so off and on. Cicero grew up essentially in the middle class and attained the sort of the senatorial rank and was super self conscious about his status and that's why he was what would be you know he was part of a party that was called the optimates which meant the best men right we are the best element of society and he was very self-conscious about where he'd come from in a way that led him to be super um, um, self-conscious and not gracious and 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 all of the ways that, that you've described him i think he's also brilliant and, and deserving of his i do need to put a small word in in for cicero because he was also a brilliant rhetorician yep. regardless of what his underlying yep. <laughs> psychic uh, challenges he had to overcome um but uh uh you know caesar's ability to at least project that he didn't take himself too seriously at certain points was important mm-hmm. nowhere ever in any source of I come across has said that the guy had a great sense of humor, but he has to have, it's almost like when you look at what is, where there is consensus about who he was, part of him had to be funny. Um, you know, he won well, early in his military career. He won an award where uh, you, you you wore this crown, the civic crown or the grass crown. There, there are two different things and I can't remember which of the two it was. And, you know, the historians watching will chastise me for not knowing the distance difference. But one of the honors that came with it is that if you were wearing it and you walked into a room, everyone would have to stand. And so Caesar, to kind of both like needle the 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 prisses in the room and also just to kind of just you know have a little fun, would put that thing on, 
walk into the Senate, have everybody stand up, walk out, have everybody sit down, walk back in, have everybody stand up. I mean, that's funny. He's funny. Even though nothing says he's funny, he's funny. Well, he there's, funny. Yeah. there's another one. Um, now, hopefully you'll remember the details because, because I can't remember. I think, I think Caesar was probably consul at this point. He might have been dictator. And um, someone is giving him giving him a hard time in the chamber. Um, it might have been uh, it might have been Cato. Mm. And Caesar gets a letter or a series of letters, right? You, I think you might be able to guess where I'm going with this. And um, and so you know, I'm just going to say it was Cato. Maybe, maybe not. So if the historians are here, you know, add a comment and tell me I'm wrong. I'll be happy to do that. But um, so Cato says well you know well, what are you reading or something and so caesar reads the letter and it's a love letter from his like his, either his ex-wife or something and it, so <laughs> it's a love letter to caesar from what's his name's some yeah. woman in his life and so he reads it out loud and right. th- that is funny too um it would be even more funny if it wasn't if he if it wasn't a real letter and he just <laughs> you know <laughs> pretended it was but either way that is pretty hilarious yeah, he's he's accused in the Senate of conspiring and and look, he's reading personal correspondence. It's probably yeah. about how we're gonna overthrow the government and and whatever. And see, you're you're you know you know pointing 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 and and so dem- I demand you read that what it is right now. And it's like, <laughs> dear Caesar, you're you're the coolest love. And again, I actually can't remember exactly. I remember the circumstances. So, uh, you know, we we will uh, share in the chastisement from those more well informed, but. Uh, yeah, it's it's like, OK, you really want me to read this, you know, um, you know, meet me at the bathhouse type of stuff. <laughs> yeah, he, he, he just knew he always knew how to like deflate someone else's balloon without fully popping it. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I uh, I wanted to comment on something because um, th- this book that you wrote, Philip, isn't, you know, what made Caesar a wonderful man or a wonderful <laughs> leader. It's the leadership genius of Julius Caesar. And it was, I think, crafted for uh, the mm-hmm. types of people that you work with uh, in, in a corporate capacity. And, um, and so there are these ideas about who he was and what he did that could be uh, looked at as, um, as optimal or, or, or fairly constructive by any standards. And uh, there's a a passage I'd like to read here from your book. It says, Caesar parlayed his self-confidence into stronger organizational faith in his abilities and commitment to his cause. If we cannot take firm action and have the courage of our convictions, then how can you or how can anyone inside our organization be expected to do the same? So something we haven't yet really touched upon about your book is that th- this was, I think, written to um, as a, as a kind of you know w- what are the lessons of of these various uh, ways in which Caesar behaved and took action and communicated, and uh, so there's this intention to instill or or help the average individual or or corporate um, executive to assimilate uh, Caesar's modus operandi. And, and values. And I, I wonder if uh, you might talk a little bit about, uh, because there are many in, individuals like ourselves who aren't corporate executives um, or, or in, that, in that field, who are just individuals who are seeking to, to, to grow in some dimension or another in their respective fields or organizations or, or wherever. So uh, what... Uh, what could you say about assimilating who Caesar was for one's own personal um, uh, enlightenment or, or awareness or growth? Um, can I answer, answer this in a torturously roundabout way? Absolutely. Feel free to edit after that. Okay. <laughs> our, fav- our favorite way. <laughs> yeah. So, so the um, I'll give you just a tiny bit of perspective on how this book came to be. Uh, which starts to answer the question a little bit. So uh, the, the publisher of this book is, is Barrett Kohler Publishers. It's a boutique in, in um, Oakland, California. They're absolutely wonderful people. And I'm an absolute nobody. And if you want to feel small in the world, try to be a nobody and publish through, you know, uh, through a publishing house. 
there's so many people who are there to tell you you're nobody. And they were willing to listen to who I was and what I had to say and give me an opportunity to write for an audience. And they did so because I'd actually drafted a different version of this book. In fact, a radically different version of this book, which, uh, which I called The Road to Triumph, Ancient Rome on Modern Leadership. And I profiled five different people who are either Roman or associated with Rome, uh, including, you know, Scipio Africanus, for whom my dog is named, uh, my, my 19 pound uh, Jack Russell Boston Terrier, uh, or that's what we think, he's a rescue dog, that's our best guess. Um, Hannibal, right, you know, the great Hannibal. Uh, and one of the chapters is about Caesar. And I wrote a, you know, 45,000 word manuscript and, uh, you know, shopped it around and Barrett Kohler folks said, we like your voice, but not necessarily what you're saying. It's, it's way too broad, be more specific. And I said, and I got, you know, you, you get that, that opportunity cost. I already wrote it. I want to defend it. Oh my God, the thought of starting again is a nightmare. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I tried to talk them into letting the original manuscript stand and they said no. And they made me essentially resubmit a book proposal that would be more specific to what they were looking for. And, uh, then, you know, I got really anxious and tried to basically take Caesar and Augustus, his successor, who was the concluding chapter of that book, and basically just take half the manuscript out and say, it's almost done. And they said, it's too broad. It needs to be narrower. And we had this debate between us over who we should look at, Caesar or Augustus, because Augustus is also brilliant and genius and probably the two greatest leaders in the Roman sense succeeded one another. And that is an incredible historical uh, fact, or, or at least what I interpret to be a fact. And they said it's too broad. And so they finally, we settled on Caesar. And then they said, so what? Okay, Caesar is a good leader. So what? And, and uh, the editors that I work with there, Neil and Anna, whom I have so much love and respect for, uh, you know, they taught me how to say something useful or at least what they felt was useful enough that would warrant putting their name on the side of the book and the so what is so important to say and that's part of why it's different than just a historical treatise because who am i to write i'm not adrian goldsworthy right who wrote you know caesar life of a colossus i'm certainly not theodore monsman i'm not richard meyer i'm not any of the great biographers of caesar and they said you need to figure out what is unique to your worldview that's unique to Caesar and put those things together in a manner that, that is going to be something that would be useful to people. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, what I tried to do with this book is to say, okay, given the things I'm not qualified for, here's, let me offer you my opinion where maybe I have at least firmer ground to stand on. And I think that, that, um, you know, as I've written the book, I said, my view on him has changed a little bit since, since writing, you know, the, sort of humility to know that you can always grow as a leader and the forgiveness of apparently contradictory things that find their combination in the same person are like a couple of the personal lessons that I've even tried to take since having written this book. And, you know, my peers and colleagues will judge whether or not I've been successful in that, but at least that's, that's what I've tried for. He is in many ways, sort of a man for all people, whether you agree with my arguments or not, whether you agree with the distillation of certain lessons or not, I am fairly confident that any leader out there can look at inside this book, reflect on the life of career of Caesar and say, there's something in his example that I can learn from. And whether it's drawn from my book or just inspired by the thought process that would lead to some other conclusion, I do hope that anyone who is aiming to be a better leader, and that doesn't, leader always tends to connote business or politics, but it's more than that, right? It's just the role that you play with those with whom you interact. I think there's something in him for everyone. He is endlessly fascinating. He's he's a he's an enigmatic and yet somehow deeply knowable person. And uh, you know, there is a ring of truth to him even today, 2000 years ago. Uh, you know, one of the things I say in the book is I think of all the the ancient people, he'd be the most comfortable in the modern boardroom, right? He just kind of had a pragmatism about him that was wholly unique. He could let go of the puffery when he needed to to just kind of get real. He could be charming and persuasive as opposed to talking and boring rhetoric. And, and you know, he, he was just a accessible human being, even at the highest point of power in his you know, 
country, which is not technically the right term, but in his country's history to that point, no one had ever accumulated this much power as he had, and yet he could be a real human being at the same time in a way that was completely unique. And so I think regardless of where anyone falls on a political spectrum, on a historical spectrum, on a business leadership standpoint, whatever, there's something that's in it for, for everyone. And among the most rewarding things for me in having written this book, aside from the, the privileged opportunity to talk to folks like yourself who just want to discuss it more, uh, as part of my own little marketing, I got 100 copies of the book and I mailed it to every CEO on what was the Fortune 100 at that time with a handwritten note. I wrote this, I'm giving you a copy, read it, or, you know, I'm sure you get millions. If it looks of interest, please do. And if not, you know, just maybe share it with someone on your team. And I have handwritten notes from about a dozen CEOs, some of whom who are just absolute legends saying, thank you for the book. I, I read it with great interest, or I will read it with great interest, or, you know, I gave this to so-and-so because, and actually what was really neat for me is that you know, I got about a dozen of those letters. That's a 12% response rate. That's about six times higher than the average direct response campaign response rate would get, which shows that a lot of those leadership values, gratitude, humility, expression, communication, et cetera, do find voice in, you know, a good number of modern corporate leaders. So uh, I'm grateful. And I actually think that the leadership capabilities that exist in society are a lot higher than perhaps reading headlines about politics might mm -hmm might lead people to believe so anyway again that was, that, I, I promised a roundabout answer and sure as hell no, no. that that took Great. a while to get there that was beautiful no thank you philip that's uh maybe we can wrap up shortly sure. um because that was a good place to, to to almost end but i wanted to ask one more thing yes. um, about your new book but as a lead into that you mentioned the kind of uh the con the inner conflict of judging a person from 2000 years ago by, you know, our standards or their standards and particularly mm -hmm. Caesar, we can look at him and, and look at all of the things that he did, the wars that he engaged in the, you know, what, what would now be considered genocide and ethnic cleansing, um, right. which, which all Roman generals engaged in, um, and look at it by today's standards or, or the standards of 2000 years ago. And but one, one other thing that we can do is look at him not only within the standards of his time, but we can compare him with others of his time and mm -hmm. see how he might align with, with what others were like. And, and you've done that a few times so far in the interview today. Um, like you could, you could compare him to the, the previous, I, I think it, he wasn't the, the, he wasn't the only previous dictator or the, the most, the, the, pr the closest in time, but Sulla. So right. Sulla, who had who had um, um, well interactions with Caesar's uncle Marius, but mm -hmm. Sulla, you compare how Sulla did things and how Caesar did things, and Sulla was a pretty nasty guy, and nasty by today's standards, and um, well for sure, and compare uh, in comparison to Caesar, also quite nasty. And your new book is uh, Evil Roman Emperors. I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit about it maybe its genesis and how you how you would fit caesar into that and and maybe i know that uh from reading the description of the book it's almost like a countdown where you get to the most evil <laughs> yeah. uh, emperor or, or, or in your opinion yeah, yeah in, in your in your in, in your yeah. assessment um so i won't ask you to rev to reveal the number one unless you want to but uh maybe just talk a little bit about the new book yeah sure and, and thanks for bringing up sula uh you know, Sula Felix was his surname, meaning lucky. And it's kind of funny because he didn't really achieve much by luck. He achieved a lot through brutality. Um, uh, and, and he is not, there's not a dedicated chapter on him, but there's a, there, it, he is featured in a, in a way that, that makes my argument of why he can, uh, deserves consideration for being among the very worst. Um, uh, and by the way, there is a book in between, uh, which is called the history of Rome and 12 buildings. Uh, which is my attempt to help people orient where they are when they're in Rome through the history of the specific place. It's cool. sort of place-based history. Uh, and I had a lot of fun writing that book. I'm, I'm immeasurably proud of it, but nevertheless, so evil Roman emperors, I hate the name. I wasn't allowed to pick it. I've, it's grown. I hated it at the time. I kind of like it now because it is just blunt. It is what it is. Yeah. Part of it is because of my geekery, not all the people covered are emperors. The, in, in historical terms, the empire and therefore the emperors that sat atop it cover but a smaller portion of a broader 
historical patterns. So there was a monarchy, there was the Republic, there were interregnums between rulers, there was, right? And so uh, I trying to take the whole sweep of Roman history and look at who are the very worst. And I also, and I think is very unique, I don't just consider people, I also consider institutions. Hmm. And you know, you can, this isn't a spoiler, because if you look at the table of contents, you'll see a chapter on something that's called the Praetorian Guard, which were a, a military body that evolved to serve as the bodyguard to the emperor. They were at a point, the only armed troops allowed in the city. And they used that power for very ill means, including assassinating a ton of emperors to either put putputs in or try to get their own people in charge. My friend Aurelian, whom I first met through the city walls, when I mean, you get to know him, he was only emperor for five years, but they were five of the most extraordinary years in terms of accomplishment. And he was murdered by his own Praetorian guard. So for th reasons like that, the Praetorians are in there. There's an argument to be made that the Senate was in there. There are kings that ruled, or they're you know, largely semi-mythic, but at least based on what the sources say, that deserve consideration. So it's it it's uh it's trying to take the worst of and distill down who they were and why, but to do it in a manner that's not voyeuristic, that's not like you know overly indulgent in the bloodshed that resulted from these terrible people. I think the caption that I wrote was a lighthearted look at the dark side of the Roman soul. And, you know, just trying to not just keep saying, oh, and he killed 10,000 people. Oh, and he killed 8,000 people. Oh, and he slaughtered these people because that gets repetitive and it's dull. So not just why, but in, in a way get to the same point, right? What's the essence of the person making this decision? It's like, what was the character? You know, obviously someone like a Nero or a Caligula is going to show up on this list. Who were they? Why were they that way? What things shaped them that led them to believe? What is the debate about what the essence of their character was? And oh, by the way, you know, here's the decisions that they made and the actions that they made that, you know, make the argument that they warrant consideration on this list. So there's, um, there's actually 11 people, uh, two, two are like one chapter is kind of two people that were related to one another that served in rapid succession at the very end of the empire. So it, it kind of takes them chronologically and then goes 10 to one. And my argument as to why, and I think it's fun. I really enjoyed writing the book. Uh, I really hope it's successful. One of the, uh, one of the weird little quirks about being an otherwise nobody is that each publisher considers the book sales of the prior book before they decide whether or not they're going to put a book out for you. And uh, so this is my like, oh God, please buy this book. Cause if you don't, I won't be allowed to write another. <laughs> so to your audience, you have great power. You can either further <laughs> my writing career or you can crush my soul and spirit. It's entirely up to you. But the book is actually, I think quite a lot of fun. It is amazing that Rome lasted as long as it did with so many terrible people. It shows the power of the institutions that they built to govern over a long period of time that, that almost disconnected the capriciousness of any individual ruler over the success of the cumulative whole. And uh, you know, Rome lasted, if you wanna measure it a certain way, about 2000 years from the founding of the city to the collapse of Byzantium. And that's not for nothing, right? It, it did some things right along the way, kind of despite the bad people. So it's also to, to sort of celebrate the the, rigid, the the resiliency of its institutions as well. And what did the Romans ever do for us? <laughs> that's right, exactly. <laughs> what have the Romans ever done for us? So funny, yeah. There, there is a, there's a lot to be learned, and you know, on the continuum of entertainment to conveyance of knowledge and insight, all of which have value. I, this is definitely more entertainment than it is like business insights. No one's going to try to say, you know what? I want to approach this meeting like Caligula, <laughs> right? Or let's hope not. I'm sure there are plenty of CEOs, maybe <laughs> all the ones that didn't respond when I mailed them a copy of this damn book in the first place. Um, but uh, uh, yes, I think there's, uh, uh, I, tr I will say, I try very hard to avoid this, what I would call a lesson in the negative. Like here's an example in terms of business leadership or community leadership. Here's the awful example that you shouldn't learn from. I think it's more helpful to give people positive examples. Here's the good example that you should, or at least the good behavior element of a particular behavior that you can model from. So this is definitely not framed as much as a leadership book. Although I do think that there are some like, oh gosh, here's some patterns that I need to be on the lookout for to evolve. Either way, I hope it's fun. I liked it. 
uh, I'm happy with it. I'm, I'm proud of it. I'm proud of the, the previous ones. And I'm very grateful to the people that have given me an audience both to write and to talk about it. Uh, because as someone who's an avowed nobody in this space, I wouldn't be here without you. So thank you very much for the opportunity to do it. Great. Thank you, Philip. We're looking forward to the new book. Uh, and it comes out May 15th. Is that correct? I think they kicked the pub date back to June 1st because June of 1st. Uh, a backlog in the printer. Okay. Uh, because the, uh, uh, you know, COVID ruined everything, right? Including what, now that they're trying to bring people back in, production runs, et cetera. So June 1st. But it's available for pre-order now. So in some respects, it, you can go get it uh, <laughs> if you want. And uh, and and by the way, uh, as as in the nobody status, mm -hmm. those rev mean reviews really hurt my feelings. <laughs> so like, be nice to me. I swear I'm a nice guy. I'm just trying my best. <laughs> so reading and writing a review, reading books is important. Writing reviews is too. So to to your audience, not, I'm not, not, don't just mean this for self-serving. Like, thank you for engaging with authors. Um, I have a lot of friends who are at a similar, like entry level position in this world. And it actually means a lot to us to hear from you, what you think. And uh, when you have something nice to say, please don't withhold it because it's immensely helpful. If nothing else, the, you know, my, my dear friend who is, is the only person who's been thanked in the, the acknowledgement sections of every book I've ever written, including three that I've written that I haven't published because they ultimately deemed to be not good said that it is the enduring fearing of authors that someone somewhere is just about to discover that you're no good. And it's true. It's agonizing to put your name on something and offer it to the world. Uh, it's agonizing to come here and, and hope that you like me and my, my, what I have to say. But uh, my, my, my ultimate reaction here is gratitude. I'm so grateful for the chance to talk to you and to learn from you and hear more about yourselves as well and your work. And, uh, you know, consider me at your service. Anything that I could do for you from here on out uh, would be my pleasure and honor to do so. Great. Thank you, Philip. I just want to say one final thing that I've, I've read several, several books on Caesar. Like we were saying, like I was saying to you before we went, before we started recording, um, you know, I'm a big fan of Caesar, big fan of like, I, I like reading about that time and, and this individual. And even though I've, I've read all the, or many of the greats, like, you know, Gelzer and Momsen and, mm -hmm. and, um, some of the newer ones, I still think that that your book is my favorite Caesar book because uh, you know it's it's not, you you can't go to it like it's not a history, so you can't go for it go to it for his full life or anything like that. But there's there's a um, it's essential like well there's a an, like an emotional connection that, that like that I could feel with with not only you but with the time and with and with Caesar like the, something about actually looking at what might be what might just be one interpretation of his character, but one which I happen to think is pro probably pretty close to accurate, and um, something that I don't find reading a lot of histories, even a lot of the the big ones that you know get into all kinds of stuff. Like, kind of in in little bits bits and pieces, you got to the what what I consider could be and probably is the essence of what this guy was actually like in all of that contradiction and um, and complexity and and. Enigma and all of those things. So I just wanted to thank you again for for writing an engaging book. Um, thank you for um, r reminding me of that other book because I'd forgotten about that one. I don't have it. The one about uh, his, his the, about Rome in twelve places, right, or twelve buildings. Yeah, here's your Rome so, in twelve buildings. Yeah. So I'll I'll include links to your books uh, in the description so people can get them. Is there a preferred place to pre-order the the new book? I mean, everything's Amazon as much okay. as I wish, you know, it, yeah. as, as much as they're like iconoclastic trend in me says like, you know, I, I, they're the ones, I mean, that's okay. where to get, that's where to I'll, get the book. So. I'll include links then and to, to there so people can pre-order it because I'm looking forward to it. So thanks again, Philip. Uh, we had a great time and um, yeah, take care and we'll look forward to the new book. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it, you all. It was a real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you guys.